Welcome back to our series on Introductory Statistics. I'm Mark Ledbetter. This is Lecture Video 37. We are in Section 9.2. This is Part 2, and we are still reviewing Section 9.1, where we're testing uh, the mean, a hypothesis test for the mean when we do know sigma. As I've mentioned before, that's not a very realistic case, but it is uh, good to know this because uh, sometimes we do assume that we know the population standard deviation and perform these tests. So we will continue with that. I hope you um, enjoy this pre-recorded video. Now, I have seen students who did not put this part in there. They just put 4.7 or they just put, uh, they, they don't put in mu, so they just have equals 4.7%. I will count off for that because it doesn't make any sense. So if you, if you were just to write, and then it doesn't make any sense. If we were to, if, if you had this, then this is not understandable. Nobody will know what you mean, even statisticians, because you didn't tell us what you're testing. There's no symbol here. We need to have, we need to have the symbol so that we know what we're testing, because we can do a hypothesis test for the variance, or standard deviation, we can do it for the mean, the median, the mode, we can do it for um, just about anything we want to test. So you have to put the symbol, and it's easy. It's always going to be, in this class, mu is equal to, for the H naught, and then mu, and you'll notice that this value here is the same value here. So we're always going to have, we're always going to have mu, we're always going to have equals in the null hypothesis. And in the alternative, we'll always have mu, and we'll have the same value that we had in the null hypothesis. What will change is this symbol, depending on what our claim is. If our claim is greater than, we put a greater than. If it's less than or lower or something like that, we put less than. If it's different or not something, then we put the not equals to. Okay. So I hope this is helping reinforce the right or the correct uh, method for this. So now let's look at our test statistic. I always want you to write the formula. Z observed, because we know sigma, we can use Z observed equals X bar minus mu over sigma over the square root of n. Or if you like the formula that I do, it's the same formula, just rewritten because we have a fraction on the bottom. And so um, if I'm not calculating this, this value on the bottom, then I will use this other format, which is easier for my calculator. But they're both the same equation. They give you exactly the same answer as long as you use your calculator correctly. Okay. So since I haven't calculated the variance or the standard deviation for my x bar, I'm going to use this uh, second part of the equation with the square root of n. So I need to go find n. And n was my random sample. So n is 10. Square root of 10. Not a nice number. And then I have to find x bar and mu. Well, mu is right here. Right here, I have the value that I need to plug in for mu. Now let's go find x bar. And usually x bar will be specified. And here it is, it says 5.38%. So I'm going to plug in 5.38%. Okay. And in this question, the book actually said what mu was equal to, but normally you don't have that. In real life, we don't know mu. So no one ever tells us what it is. They just tell us a value that we want to compare to. And so this value that we're comparing to is mu naught, or mu, in this case, when we say mu is equal to 4.7, so this could be minus 4.7% divided by, now sigma. Now here's the key. I'm using percent. If I'm going to use percent for mu, I have to use percent for sigma. If I don't use 
a percentage for one of these. I have to not use it for the others as well. Okay, so everything has to be in the same units, and then they those units cancel out. Okay, so sigma, we are told from the problem, is 2.4%. So I can just plug in 2.4%. Okay, now let's see what this is equal to. I see I didn't leave myself much room, but uh, it's okay. So I'm going to put into my calculator the square root of 10, and then times, and then I'm putting the parentheses here, this parentheses, out to 5.38 minus 4.7, and then I'm going to close the parentheses, and then I hit divide. If you don't do it exactly that way, you will get the wrong answer. So again, I put this, I hit the square root sign in my calculator. Sometimes you, in some calculators, you have to say 10 and then square root. Do whatever your calculator does. And then hit the times, the times button. And then you need to use this open parenthesis, 5.38 minus 4.7, close the parenthesis, then sit, say divide by, and then type in 2.4. I get 0.8959, and so forth. It's a z-score, so I need to round this to two decimal places to use my table. Equals 0 0.90, because I go to the third decimal place, it's a 5. Remember, if it's 5 or higher, we round up the, the value that's right here, the second value, or the value to the left. So a 9, the only thing I can round that up is to a 10, which makes this 0 0.90. Right. My rejection criteria is always the same, but I want you to write it down. It's going to be that the p-value is less than alpha. And I have this on the formula sheet so you can see it. It's right there. Now I need to find my p-value. So my p-value, I need to uh, take uh, this observed, my test statistic value, which is Z observed. And Z observed is a 0.9, that's positive. And then because I'm looking for a p-value, it's going to be the area that's farther away from zero. Always it's going to be a more extreme uh, value. So our test statistic is 0.9, and we need to find this area but we can't find this area in our table. What we can find is this area here, and I should have grabbed my tables earlier, but it won't take me but a second to grab the Z table here. And what I need is I need to find a positive 0.90. So I'm lining this up. I need a 0.9, which is over here, and then a zero. So 0.8159 is the value below 0.9. So it's the area below that. So let's go back to that, 0.8159. So point, oops, 0.8159 is the value less than 0.90. This is certainly not my p-value. In this class, we should not have p-values greater than 0.5. It's an introductory course, so I'm not going to try to trip you up. So if you get a value that's greater than 0.5, then you uh, need to subtract that from 1 because you're on the wrong side. So we're going to take 1 minus 0.8159, which gives me 0.1841. And so 9, 9, 10. Yep. Okay. So... 0.81, uh, 0.1841 is my p-value because it's a, a one-tailed test. It's a, a right-tailed test. I don't have to do anything. I get the value. Remember, if it's a two-tailed test, you have to take this value and multiply it by two because we're looking at both sides. Here, we're only looking at one. So my p-value, now I'm going to plug in to this equation below it, 0.1841 is less than alpha, which is 0.01. If you remember 
um, up here, we were given alpha, and I wrote it down, alpha equals 0.01. So this is the rejection criteria. Is this statement true? No, it is not. 0.1841 is definitely bigger than 0 0.01. If the statement is not true, then we do not reject H naught. And we're always, when we're talking about a decision, we're always talking about H naught, the basis, not the claim. We want to prove the claim, and I say prove loosely, statistically, uh, say that we want to we want to show that the claim is statistically significant at some uh, level. And to do that, uh, we have to determine what our alpha is, 0.01. Now notice that even if I changed alpha to 0.05, this statement would not be true. If I changed it to 0.1, this statement would not be true. And we, we rarely, if ever, use an alpha that's bigger than 0.1. Okay? So we do not reject H naught. So the formal way of saying that is uh, we fail to reject H naught. Now, if you say we do not reject H naught as your decision, I'm perfectly fine with that. Um, I say that myself, so it's, it's, it's perfectly fine. The book is being uh, quite particularly correct. Um, but um, I'm, I'm fine with we do not reject H naught as well. And if the statement were true, then we would reject. So we'd say we reject H naught would be our decision. Remember that the decision and the conclusion are two different things. So since we fail to reject or we do not reject H naught, there does not or there... Uh, There does not exist sufficient evidence to support the claim. And here, this claim, I have written it in. Let's go back up and look at this claim. Where did I find it? Remember, I underlined it here. It's the question in this case, do these data indicate that? What comes after that is, the, it should say mean, the mean dividend yield of all Australian banks is higher than 4.7%. That's our claim. That's what we're trying to say. And that is exactly what, let me change color here so it'll show up a little bit better. That is exactly what this claim says, H1, mu is greater than 4.7. Mu is the mean of all Australian bank stocks. Greater than, larger than, higher than 4.7%. So there does not exist sufficient evidence to support the claim that the mean dividend yield of all Australian bank stocks is higher than 4.7% at a confidence level. We need confidence level. Remember that our confidence level is one minus alpha. So the confidence level in alpha have to add up to 100%. So alpha was 0.01, so our confidence level is going to be a 99% confidence level. So we always write that as a percentage in this. When we're talking to the public, we want to put it in terms they can understand. And so at a, there does not exist sufficient evidence to support the claim that the mean dividend yield of all Australian bank stocks is higher than 4.7% at a 99% confidence level using a simple random sample of size 10. This is N. And you can say N equals 10 as well. That's fine, but definitely put the number. Well, that's the end of this video. Please remember to scan your lecture notes before midnight of the date listed on the course calendar. If you have questions, please come to virtual office hours. I am very happy to help you, as always. If you can't do that, then you're welcome to email me. But when you email me, I need two things from you. 
The first is a picture of the problem so that I can help you through email. I may not have the problem available to me. If you don't send me the problem, then you're going to have to wait until I get back to my computer and get that problem pulled up. So please send me a picture of the problem. The second thing you need to send me is a picture of your work so far. This helps me understand how you're approaching the problem and may help me or will help me uh, help you faster and better. So I hope you will stay safe and take care of yourself. Until next time, we'll see you then.